of time and being respectful for everybody's um, uh, time on the call. Yes, sir. Um, bleeding in the abdomen, um, somewhat controversial. Do you recommend washing out the abdomen uh, for bleeding, or would you leave the blood behind? Or so I think uh, right, right. So that's a great question, Keith. And I think uh, it, it depends also on the type of of case. I I have a low threshold to do this uh, for somebody who may have had a bypass and has a lot of blood in there, and especially if they're very symptomatic, lots of abdominal pain, because that will make them symptomatically better. Some of those patients tend to be tachycardic. Um, they have the systemic inflammatory response to the bleeding. Um, but on the other hand, and I've done this, if I have a sleeve patient who may have a blood clot that's not that big, symptomatically they're fine and don't have a problem, I, I'm not going to go back. And, I, and I've done this in a patient or two after sleeve. Uh, um, I think we all pretty much uh, would agree that closing the <coughs> jejunal, uh, jejunal defect is, is uh, certainly prudent to help prevent internal hernias at that <coughs> area. Uh, what's your uh, opinion of closing that Peterson's defect? Do you close it? What, what are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so um, I've always closed that defect um, and the reason I, I, I closed the defect, both defects, is because early in my career as bariatric surgeon, I, had, I saw too many internal hernias. Now, none of them were mine because I had not done a lot of cases yet. But, uh, and that is very relevant to this presentation because um, if you're a general surgeon and you're on call somewhere, you'll see those patients. They do 10. They move around. If you had the surgery done somewhere else, they come. Uh, the vast majority that probably took within a year care of five or six patients that have come to the, our emergency room, all with internal hernias, acute presentations. None of them were done in our program, but they all had internal hernias. And my experience has been they occur more common um, after anticholic uh, bypass in the Peterson's defect rather than the JJ defect. And some of the literature suggests that too. So I think it's more important actually to close I, th I think it's important to close both defects, but it's more important to close the Peterson's rather than the uh, the JJ. If you were to choose, I'm I'm going to choose to close both. Okay, and then um, finally, uh, you know, leaks can be a very um, difficult problem, in, especially in the in the setting of a sleeve because of the relatively high pressure system. Um, what is your take on uh, treating that with? Uh, uh, drainage, stenting, what, what, um, can you touch upon that? Yes, sir. So, um, over the past few years, I think we've taken care of a few leaks after sleeve. We only had one in our program, but we've had uh, two or three more transferred to us from other programs in the area. Um, and we've tried stents, we've tried uh, drains. I think they all eventually healed. They clearly take longer to heal than bypass leaks. But um, um, my personal experience with stents has been um, so so. So I've had patients that it helped with, and I had other patients that it didn't really help that much. Uh, oftentimes, with stents, you may see it leak around the stent and still come out. Uh, but I think what's the most important thing in the acute phase is to, to take control of the leak, right, with a drain. Uh, I think we all would probably put a stand in because it may help. Um, um, but the other thing that is also very important is to establish central access uh, because uh, some of those leaks may take a while to heal. And um, there's a group from Abu Dhabi that has published on this. Uh, they've taken a lot, care of a lot of leaks, I guess, but they just put a feeding jejunostomy or a nasal jejunal uh, feeding tube and feed the patient until uh, they heal it. And they will heal it. Um, uh, what we've done was combination of TPN or feeding jejunostomy or stand and drain. I think uh, you may end up using a lot of these modalities rather than a simple one, a single one to be able to get these patients over. But maintaining their nutrition is extremely important uh, and controlling the, the sepsis, uh, obviously, are the two um, hallmarks to take uh, successfully care of this. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I, our final thank you, uh, uh, topic for discussion will be uh, by Dr. <laughs> gastrectomy versus ruin why gastric bypass outcomes. Um, uh, Stacy, thanks for staying on the line, and we certainly look forward to your presentation.
Well, thank you, Keith, and uh, fully enjoyed the other three talks uh, that preceded me. Um, I'm going to talk less about technique and just provide some comparative data between gastric bypass and deep gastrectomy. Um, in 20 minutes or so, we can't give a comprehensive view of all of the outcomes. But so what I'm really focusing on, because I think it is a generally a deciding factor for, for some of these patients in terms of which operation to do, is, is the effect that they have on diabetes. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Tim, the, the sleeve gastrectomy has gained a lot of popularity over the last five years, both in terms of patient preference and surgeon preference, but also the payer uh, uh, willingness to cover these operations has is, is gone up significantly as we've got more experience with it. This is some data from a Buckwald uh, worldwide survey showing that trend of that red line heading upward in 2011. This is some data from the U.S. Uh, published by Nen Wen that demonstrate that hatched mark uh, on the top right there is a um, growing number of sleeve gastrectomies uh, occurring over the last uh, four or five years. And if you look at estimates of the current numbers, this is some data that is unpublished, but we put it together uh, on the Executive Council, ASMBS's uh, task force put together um, uh, some numbers because one of the questions we always get asked is, well, number one, how, how many procedures are being done a year and what's the next? And this was uh, based largely on MBS AQIP data, but also the previous data and some assumptions made about some of the national databases. Uh, and our best estimate at this point is that uh, about 180,000 cases a year being done in the United States, and, and the majority of these are now sleeve gastrectomies. And if anyone who participates in the uh, accreditation program will see the national numbers pretty clear that sleeve is more commonly performed in gastric bypass, uh, as shown here. Uh, the other, uh, of course, thing to note is that the band numbers have gone down significantly uh, as that uh, operation has lost a lot of popularity. So uh, I'm just going to give uh, examples of a few papers, some observational comparative data, and then I'll talk about some of the randomized data that compare this bypass and the sleeve. The first paper I'll talk about with uh, respect to this is a study sort of more, instead of long-term, it's actually more kind of medium-term effects of sleeve gastrectomy and bypass on type 2 diabetes in morbidly obese patients. And the follow-up here is about 36 months. There's 153 patients, uh, twice as many gastric bypass. And what they really wanted to do was look at predictors of diabetes remission. And there's no question that weight loss, weight recidivism both have important effects on uh, the duration of the diabetes and glycemic control. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we, we don't really have a real good handle on the natural history of sleeve gastrectomy yet. The first sleeve paper was published in 2003. I mean, that was just a decade ago, and so we're now just getting some five- and eight-year data that demonstrate, in general, 55 to 60 percent excess weight loss in the long term, probably closer to 55 percent. Um, but then weight loss certainly is, is more than enough for early diabetics who, who go into remission. But um, in this particular, this particular study uh, clearly demonstrates that patients in that top line, patients who achieved remission of their diabetes had more weight loss and they sustained that weight loss. And those that had either no remission or recurrence had less weight loss kind of out of the gate and also uh, regained some of their weight or had less excess weight loss in the long term. So, We'll talk a lot about the metabolic effects of these two operations, but there's no question that the long-term weight regain or continued weight loss plays a, a pretty big part in, in the maintenance of the glycemic control. And when they did their analysis, they found that the, the, the strongest indicator for uh, predicting remission was, uh, or lack of remission after these operations was pa were patients who were on insulin prior to the time of surgery, uh, a high A1C preoperatively, and a long duration of diabetes. Uh, preoperatively, uh, and this all speaks to the, the d duration and severity of the disease, the beta cell function at the time of the disease, and really where you're intervening in the course of the diabetes. And in these uh, patients who did not go into remission, and this has been shown in many, many studies, the later you intervene, the less likely you are to get full recovery of the beta cell function and less chance of remission. Uh, those things that predicted remission were bypass operation, compared to the sleeve, younger age, lower A1C, and, and, and less of insulin use preoperatively. And patients who went into remission but then had recurrence uh, had uh, an older age and had higher insulin use preop and also had gained some weight 
in the long term after they initially had gone into remission, as I mentioned earlier. So we looked at this in, one, in our patient population. We, we have had a, a fairly high volume practice for the last decade, so we now have some patients out to five years beyond. And this is a study you know, we published in Annals uh, last year, but uh, it really is a retrospective study, so take a little bit with the granite salt in terms of directly comparing comparison of bypass and the sleeve, because um, at this time, when we, you know, this is 10 years ago, when we were using the sleeve then, we were using it for a little bit different demographic than we use it now, where we use it fairly widely across the board for many types of patients. These were a little bit higher risk, a little bit older patients with a little bit more long-standing diabetes, and that's reflected here in this uh, uh, phase line characteristics that demonstrate, uh, you know, the, let me get this arrow dragged over there. Let me see if I can get that. There we go. The, uh, well, it's not going to go. Anyway, in the red there, you can see the uh, the differences at baseline between the sleeve gastrectomy and banding groups compared to the bypass groups. So just keep that in mind as we look at the data. And most of this data is driven by the gastric bypass. But when you look at things uh, in the short term, around two years, overall, the entire cohort had a um, had a uh, excess weight loss of 60%, which equates to a, a total weight loss of around 30%. When we get out to six years, we start seeing fairly significant differences in overall weight loss. And again, this is what we see in other publications, which is 60 plus excess weight loss in the bypass group, around 50 in the sleeve, and less so in the uh, banding patients. So when we look at long-term BMI changes, again, this is out to six years, median follow-up. The gastric bypass overall lost about a little over 13 BMI points in the long term, about 11 points in the sleeve gastrectomy, and although the band patients did maintain some weight loss, it was an average of about six BMI points lost uh, in the sleeve group. And that's, that's the weight loss, but when we look at A1C changes, again, you see an intermediate effect with the sleeve gastrectomy with a slight upward trend uh, in the long term. Uh, with the gastric bypass, you see uh, uh, about a one and a half point drop in their A1C, a little bit less than one point drop in the sleeve patients in the long term. And again, these were diabetic patients. These were all comers who were diabetic. These were not selected out of severe or mild diabetes, but sort of uh, the entire group as a whole. Now this uh, graph shows a uh, representation of two-year data is on the left here, and the six-year data is on the right. The red bars and the blue bars represent remission. So Anything red or blue is A1C less than 6.5. Uh, the blue is actually less than 6.0. And as an entire cohort, about 50% of the population at six years had achieved remission, and about 20% had initially achieved, achieved remission and then ultimately went back and had some recurrence of their diabetes requiring medication, which is important to note, though, that three-quarters of these patients who had recurrence or still had an A1C less than 7, uh, so they were still fairly well controlled. But when you look at it by uh, procedure type, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll just point out this is retrospective data, not randomized. But when you look at the uh, gastric bypass at, at six years, there's about 60% uh, that are in remission uh, versus 31% of the sleeve patients, uh, and a little bit higher recurrence rate uh, in, the, uh, in the sleeve patients in the long term, uh, presumably related to some weight regain. We looked at... Uh, predictors of remission based on uh, analysis adjusting for all the factors that you see listed at the bottom there. And things that predicted remission were greater weight loss, shorter duration of diabetes preoperatively, and a bypass procedure uh, in our study. And then things that predicted recurrence were less weight loss, longer duration of diabetes, and again, weight regain. And what fell out in the analysis was a weight, uh, BMI increase of five points from their weight loss nadir predicted a recurrence of their diabetes. When you look at the ADA goals, which is a higher benchmark than what we used in the study, which is an A1C less than 7 is considered adequate control. Overall, the group had about an 80% uh, of the patients achieve that level of control. And that compares favorably to 52% nationally who are treated with medical therapy who are able to achieve an A1C less than 7. The, again, no statistical difference between the two procedures, but the bypass patients did achieve that uh, and, uh, more often than the sleeve gastrectomy patients, uh, as shown here. Uh, BP control, LDL control, and the control of all three factors, if they were all three present, uh, again, uh, significantly improved at six years and 
28% who had all three had all three under control at six years versus about 18% based on the NHANES data of those patients treated medically. So in summary from this, our long-term diabetic patients is that we had sustained weight loss, particularly after gastric bypass, a little bit less so with the sleeve, 50% remission rate, and then 24% uh, had remission, uh, meaning A1C less than six, but uh, a third of the patients who had gastric bypass actually had an A1C less than six lasting over five years. Um, and we sort of provocatively use the word cure here, but um, none of the sleeve patients were able to achieve that level of control for that long of a period of time. So the bypass does have a little more durable effect. Uh, we looked at some other cardiovascular risk factors, nephropathy, that I won't talk about here, but uh, significant improvements in those as well. This is a paper from the Michigan Bariatric uh, Collaborative, and they looked uh, focused on the sleeve gastrectomy outcomes, both 30-day, one, two, and three-year outcomes, and they used a matched group of band and bypass patients uh, to complete their analysis, and they uh, looked at all these parameters listed here in terms of weight loss complications and comorbidity uh, remission as well as quality of life. And uh, what they found was that uh, from virtually everything they looked at, the sleeve gastrectomy was intermediate between the band and the bypass. And here you can see the middle line is weight loss uh, for the sleeve gastrectomy compared to the band at the top and the bypass, which had better weight loss in the long term, uh, at least at three years uh, in this matched cohort study. And when you look at uh, diabetes and other comorbidity remission, I think it's important to note that even though the risks for the you know, sleeve gastrectomy closer approximate those of the gastric bypass compared to the band, so do the benefits. So you tend to get more robust remission rates of diabetes and sleep apnea, uh, uh, even insulin dependence to diabetes, although not clearly uh, as good as the gastric bypass. And other metabolic parameters improve to a degree closer to the gastric bypass than with the, the banding, uh, as you would expect. And then when you look at serious complications, again, it's intermediate between the bypass and the sleeve in terms of uh, uh, these are age-related uh, uh, complications according to procedure, but the risk of complications um, is clearly uh, more closely follow the gastric bypass curve than the band curve. Uh, but again, this is after three years, and we know that the band has long-term complications beyond three years. And again, in terms of weight loss, you're seeing uh, curves that are pretty expected in terms of you know, the bypass edges out the band, or excuse me, the sleeve uh, for the most part, and that's consistent across most of the studies that, uh, that we look at. And there was some randomized data comparing uh, these two procedures. Um, this is a small randomized st study out of uh, Greece that uh, just looked at uh, BMI and excess weight loss. They also looked at ghrelin and fasting uh, peptide YY, which is a hindgut hormone produced by the L cells. It is a satiety hormone that that's uh, increased after gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, but it's also uh, one of the focuses of this paper was on the, uh, the effect of ghrelin in terms of at least one year weight loss. And what they found in this small randomized study was that actually the weight loss was a little bit better in the sleeve patients here with about 70% excess weight loss. And although the PYY uh, levels were about the same for both groups, the uh, ghrelin in the gastric bypass, you know, initially went down, but then kind of went back up over time. Uh, and the ghrelin in the sleeve, and this is reproduced in other studies, goes down and pretty much stays down. Uh, these are tough things to measure in, in the lab, but I think this is, just demonstrates the point that the, ga the gastric sleeve is a, is a metabolic operation. It has got hormone effects. Uh, the question is, uh, are those effects powerful enough to be doing the operation on every patient who has uh, metabolic syndrome? And so I'll talk a little bit about our three-year data from our SCAMP trial. This is a randomized controlled trial that, that we performed at our center. Uh, Phil Shower, my boss, has uh, been the PI on this study. And we looked at um, intensive medical therapy, which is kind of shown here, there's 88 guidelines and very close follow-up with the nutrition and psychology. And we had one endocrinologist that really uh, managed all of these patients uh, and then had a very uh, de clearly defined algorithm for escalation of medical therapy over time with the target of an A1C less than six. And then this is the intensive medical therapy group. And this is how things uh, randomized out. We had randomized 150 patients and these patients are poorly controlled diabetics. All they had, they all had A1C less than, greater than seven, but most of them were in the eight to nine range. Uh, 
the BMI range was uh, on a lower BMI scale, 27 to 43. About a third of the patients had a BMI less than 35 in the study. Uh, and you can see we randomized 52 intensive medical therapy. And they all got intensive medical therapy, but one group got randomized to a bypass, the other got randomized to a sleeve gastrectomy. At three years, we had 91% retention. Uh, we did lose a fair number from the medical group. Uh, and then the three-year analysis, uh, I'll show you here. So remember, the primary endpoint is an A1C less than six, regardless of whether they were using medication or not. 5% of the medical arm was able to achieve that. And if you look at the bypass and the sleeve groups, about 25% of the uh, sleeve patients were achieving that level of control at three years. 37% of the bypass group was achieving that level of control at three years. But most of those were off medicine. There was only one that required medication to achieve that level of control. And a few more of the sleeve patients required medication to achieve that degree of control. Uh, you can see that the uh, vast majority of the two-thirds in both groups were still achieving the ADA goal of less than seven. Um, but you're seeing a little bit more robust uh, glycemic control in the bypass group at three years, as well as a little uh, significant, um, uh, non-significant difference between groups, but a greater number of patients who uh, required medication or, or escalating medical therapy in the sleeve group. We looked at some other metabolic effects there, you can see, and they were certainly statistically significant uh, compared to medical arm. And it's important to note this study was not powered to detect modest differences between the two surgical groups, but really was a comparison between medical uh, therapy and surgical therapy. And if you look at the uh, graphs of this data, the A1C with both surgical arms was down and pretty much stayed down after three years, where the A1C initially went down, but over time is continuing back up almost to the baseline in the medical arm. And similarly with body mass index, except now at three years, we're starting to see statistically significant difference in weight loss between the sleeve and the bypass. I think this is somewhat telling. I think somewhat expected that over time, we're going to see a little more weight recidivism with the sleeve gastrectomy than we will with the gastric bypass. The number of patients on insulin is still very low in both of the surgical groups and, then, and rising steadily in the, in the medical arms. And this is a five-year study, so we have two more years of data to collect. Uh, and when you look at medication use, uh, in terms of other cardiovascular medications, you can see at baseline, the majority of patients, or at least over half, were on over three cardiovascular medications. But when you look at the bypass and the sleep patients at three years, a um, total of four patients are on any sort of statins or antihypertensives, whereas half the patients are on the medical arm are still taking that stuff. We also looked at quality of life. and. Uh, you'd think with that kind of weight loss, the quality of life would not be, you know, dramatically different between the two surgical groups. But just to summarize these graphs, we can see is that in the gastric bypass, five of eight domains uh, improved, whereas with the sleeve, only two of eight domains improved, and none of them improved with the medical arm. So there was a difference in terms of overall quality of life between the two surgical procedures. And in terms of adverse events, there were no mortalities in that SAMPI trial. We had two reoperations in both of the uh, surgical groups, and you can see the listing of the other sort of minor uh, and microvascular complications that uh, occurred in, in these different arms. But again, no excessive weight regain of over five BMI points in either of the surgical uh, arms, at least after three years. So in terms of the stampede data, again, I, as I mentioned, we, we did not power the study to detect subtle differences between the two procedures, but I think the data is telling us something about the differences uh, that the bypass patients, uh, you know, are certainly able, able to achieve a little bit better glycemic control at three years with fewer medications, lower cardiovascular medication use, and a little bit greater weight loss and more improvement in quality of life. And really, it wasn't anything that specifically favored the sleeve over the bypass. And this does not mean the sleeve is a bad operation. What it means is that in these particular patients who have long-standing, poorly controlled diabetes, that the sleeve may not be as powerful a tool as the gastric bypass. And another uh, bit of evidence to support that is some of our mechanistic study from this uh, study. Uh, this is a mechanistic uh, sub-study of, of the randomized trial. We, the first 20 patients in each arm were randomized uh, and participated in some sub-studies. Again, you can see poorly controlled diabetes at baseline, BMI of 37. They underwent mixed meal testing, body composition out to two years. And I'll just point out a couple key things here. Change from baseline in terms of BMI, and this is the two years in the sub-study, was pretty similar between the gastric bypass and the sleeve. 
but when you look at truncal fat, and this is based on VEXA scan, and we had significantly more truncal fat loss in the gastric bypass patients compared to the sleeve gastrectomy patients. Um, and so there's some different, I think, mechanisms at play and different uh, uh, types of weight loss that we're seeing with the bypass compared to the sleeve. And when you look at glycemic control, again, a little bit better glycemic control overall, and it's actually statistically significant in this sub-study between the two uh, surgical arms at two years. And we performed some calculations in, uh, to calculate insulin sensitivity. The Matsuda index is a, a complex calculation that uh, correlates well with the insulin clamp studies and accounts for insulin resistance in the liver as well as the muscle bed. And what we found was a two, almost a threefold increase in insulin sensitivity after the bypass and a little more modest increase in the sleeve gastrectomy with no change in the medical arm. Uh, and then when we did the oral disposition index, which is really a ratio of insulin secretion over insulin resistance, we saw a gr markedly greater uh, uh, pancreatic islet function in the uh, bypass compared to medical therapy. And this correlated well with the decrease in truncal fat that we saw in the gastric bypass. And we saw no difference in uh, insulin islet cell function and insulin production in the sleeve gastrectomy group. Uh, compared to medical therapy. And uh, as expected, we saw an increase in GLP-1 with both the uh, procedures, decrease in GIP. And this GIP is a little controversial in terms of its role after bypass and sleeve, but it did go down in the bypass and didn't change in the sleeve gastrectomy. And from this metabolic sub-study, we concluded that, you know, the gastric bypass, at least at three years, maintains near-normal glucose tolerance associated with a nearly six-fold increase in overall beta cell function uh, and in the gastric bypass patients, we see both insulin sensitivity and secretion increase. And despite comparable weight loss in the sleeve gastrectomy group, insulin sensitivity was only partially restored and beta cell function did not improve. And so we're not seeing the same type of uh, powerful effect on uh, glycemic control with the sleeve as we are in the bypass. And there's one other randomized study that I won't go into detail on, but just to point out, this is a study out of Taiwan and compared to actually a mini gastric bypass on a BMI to sleeve gastrectomy. And they achieved, again, much higher type 2 diabetes remission rates in their bypass patients at one year compared to uh, the sleeve gastrectomy uh, arm. So in conclusion, the current observational and randomized studies favor gastric bypass over sleeve for control of severe diabetes. Uh, weight loss outcomes certainly vary, but long-term outcomes generally favor the gastric bypass. Both operations have metabolic effects, but they seem to be more powerful in the gastric bypass. Uh, but uh, clearly, you know, this pendulum with this, the sleeve gastrectomy becoming so popular is going to continue to swing. And like most pendulum, it's probably going to swing a little too far, uh, and we'll find a steady state down the road. But I think as we talk to our patients in the office, this data helps us. It doesn't necessarily drive every decision that we make. but uh, at least in my practice, patients who have severe diabetes, long-standing diabetes, require insulin. Um, uh, I throw that pretty heavily into the mix of our discussion in terms of what operation is best for them. And I'll typically recommend a gastric bypass for those patients as long as they're willing to undergo that procedure. Having said that, I think a sleeve operation, as long as they're well informed in terms of some of this data, that the risk of remission or chance of remission is lower, then I think it's reasonable to do a sleeve on those patients, understanding that they may not get the same effect bypass. So with that, I'll conclude and turn it over to Keith for the uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Stacy, uh, for that excellent summary and, and talk. 